the chairman of the Hedenick Institute, and we're really excited today to uh, present this virtual Grand Rounds uh, by David Smith. David uh, is a pediatric otolaryngologist at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. Uh, he is a clinical director of the Circadian Medicine Center there, and uh, I think this uh, may be somewhat atypical link between pediatric otolaryngologist and circadian researcher. Uh, it reveals a little bit about David. Uh, I've known David for quite a while. He was one of our residents at Johns Hopkins, uh, where I spent quite a bit of time before coming here. And I can tell you that, um, you know, we've got some other Hopkins alums, including uh, Jamie Koo and Dane Genther in our group. And uh, I think they can attest to well that uh, Dave's a really unique person, uh, one of the most I think uh, creative, curious, intelligent, and talented uh, people that really I, you know I ever came across in my career, and so uh, really excited to hear about some of his journey with this field. Uh, it's a super interesting topic, and and so uh, welcome, David, uh, to our grand rounds. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. I'm going to share my screen and then confirm that you can see what I see. <coughs> Um, hopefully you can see the, can you see my slide deck now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. So <clears throat> thank you very much for the introduction. I um, I want to talk today about, I sort of broadly described it as circadian medicine bench to bedside. Um, and I'll sort of explain a little bit as I go through this talk about how I ended up doing um, what I do now. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, and I think the objectives today, so I'm going to start basically talking about the significance of obstructive sleep apnea, which many of us know, but I just want to review sort of big topics. And then that's going to lead me into um, a very short discussion about the circadian clock, which is by no means a simple topic, um, but um, hugely relevant and hugely important for a lot of different disease processes. And I want to talk specifically about circadian dysregulation and intermittent hypoxia. And then the second sort of half of the talk, so I'm shooting for about 40 or 45 minutes. I want to talk about the clinical research that we do in the center for the newly founded Center for Circadian Medicine. So how we apply these concepts in circadian biology to patient care, or at least that's the that's the hope. <clears throat> so um, I think there are some um, people in sleep medicine, and there are also some people in otolaryngology that certainly treat obstructive sleep apnea. And I think many of us know sort of the, the prevalence numbers, but there was a really good study that came out from Mahaltra's group um, at the end of 2019 showing um, sort of really the first study looking at worldwide estimates. And it's that about a billion people between the ages of 30 to 69 years have obstructive sleep apnea. So this is a pretty um, significant number, and I think it puts it into context about sort of the worldwide prevalence. And in fact, China um, now surpassed the U.S. for um, the higher prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea. But I think the bigger sort of relevance is, um, it, you know, from um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, there was a, an evaluation of the cost. And so to diagnose and treat obstructive sleep apnea in 2015, we spent about um, $12.5 billion. But the total cost to the U.S. healthcare system for um, all of the undiagnosed sleep apnea, meaning workplace accidents, loss of productivity, added up to almost $150 billion. So this is by no means a small problem within the United States. So we, I think, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of detail talking about the, the different treatment modalities, but I work in the complex OSA um, clinic here, which is, was previously called the Upper Airway Center. And our specialty is basically treating children that have persistent obstructive sleep apnea. And there are a lot of non-surgical modalities, um, things like weight loss, sleep hygiene, certainly some pharmacotherapy, um, oral appliances, and, and certainly a lot of oxygen and CPAP, um, even in children. Um, but there is a huge percentage of um, patients after adenotonsillectomy that have persistent OSA. And so these, these more complex surgical procedures that we do, and this is a, actually a, <clears throat> a figure from the Bailey's um, otolaryngology chapter that Sally Schott and Stacey Ishman and I put together several years ago and is actually going in the revision, which we're working on now. Um, but the success rates for these procedures range from 20 to 80 percent, so they're highly variable and it still leaves a large percentage of children with persistent obstructive sleep apnea. An algorithm, you know, this is a very general algorithm from our upper airway center about how we sort of approach these children with um, what we consider to be either persistent obstructive sleep apnea or complex sleep apnea, often with um, central sleep apnea as well. And so there are a lot of treatment modalities, but once you get to the end of this flow chart, um, the question is, what do we do for 
you know, the, the sort of 20 to 30 percent of kids that still have sleep apnea that we can't necessarily treat with medical means or surgical means. And it sort of took me down this path of what are the, you know, what are the mechanisms of disease? So what causes these clinical sequela and what eventually leads to end organ damage? And we know that there is sort of a, a host of problems, even in children. They can have um, autonomic dysregulation. They can have blood pressure problems, even if they don't develop overt hypertension. Um, we know that they're more likely to have metabolic dysregulation and diabetes. And in fact, if you're obese, you have a 50% chance of having obstructive sleep apnea. So I now um, have a partner in Endocrine who runs their um, obesity clinic, and she refers um, all of those kids to our, um, our sleep disorders clinic for, uh, for polysomnography. And I think, <laughs> To really sort of describe obstructive sleep apnea, we often refer to this combination of hypoxic injury, right? So you have this overt obstruction, it causes a blockage in the airway, and you have a desaturation. And so you have these intermittent hypoxic events, which leads to um, injury and inflammation. But we also know that this uh, disease process is defined by endothelial dysfunction and sleep fragmentation. But I want to hopefully, you know, by the end of this talk, ex you know, sort of describe how circadian dysregulation could be an important component and how we go about studying it. So I, this was a study that Rauf Amin and I um, um, actually published in Sleep several years ago. And Rauf Amin is head of the pulmonary division here. And, and I really started doing a lot of clinical research with him when I was uh, an otolaryngology fellow, um, oddly enough. But one of the things that we found in this um, population of children with obstructive sleep apnea was that serum cytokine levels from children with OSA show changes in diurnal rhythmicity. And I don't know if you can see my arrows, but <clears throat> specifically what I'm talking about is if you look at sort of the PM, which is represented by the blue bar versus the AM sort of levels represented by the orange bars, you can see that if you look in the control versus those children with mild or severe obstructive sleep apnea, the levels between the PM and the AM time points actually invert. And so, and this is consistent for a lot of these uh, acute inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 and IL-8. And so we know that, again, that this is an inflammatory process, but it also tells us that this diurnal rhythmicity is a component. And so um, in sort of during this process and fellowship, I knew that I wanted to go back into the lab and I was randomly introduced to um, who is my mentor now, John Hoganesh, who is very well known in the field of um, chronobiology or circadian biology. Um, he discovered some of the early sort of core clock proteins, but it really um, sort of made me interested in um, the, the circadian clock. So I want to talk a little bit about what the clock is. I think many of us have heard about it recently. Um, the um, sort of the most notable sort of recent um, newsworthy um, attention was given to Rashbesh Hall and Young, who won the Nobel Prize in, Circa um, in Physiology and Medicine for their contribution to their work in Drosophila. But so the, the, the clock we think of as this sort of central control um, that's, that's um, primarily controlled by dark light cycles. Um, this is uh, basically sensed by our optic tract, and of course it um, stimulates the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and um, this is sort of what we consider to be the endogenous central controller of the clock. And there are obviously um, zeitgeivers or time givers, things like light and dark, but there are, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this in just a minute, but there are lots of other um, sort of non-photic zeitgeivers as well, like physical activity, temperature, um, and um, feeding time. But the, but the clock is actually a lot more than just the central controller um, in our brain. Um, it's really made up of, the, of these molecular oscillators, and this is really just a skeleton um, of sort of the positive and negative feedback loop. So um, it's, it's really a, a group of core canonical clock proteins um, that are transcription factors that regulate um, the activity of a lot of physiology throughout the 24-hour period. And um, it... I think, you know, historically we thought of clocks as being driven by the brain, but what we know now, especially from 2000 on, um, and especially um, Joe Takahashi's work, who is um, referenced at the bottom of the slide, that clocks are sort of ubiquitous. Almost um, every cell um, population in the body has a clock. So we know that um, things that, or, um, that are clock controlled and, and fluctuate throughout the 24 hour day are things like oxygen levels, food intake, and how food is broken down. Um, and so um, there's a lot of work now looking at how these peripheral clocks sort of control their individual physiologic processes. And of course, 
clocks regulate um, a host of physiology. And I think um, from a clinical perspective, it's very easy to understand blood pressure, for example. So there's a lot of research now demonstrating that blood pressure um, fluctuates over a 24 hour period. Um, you have peaks and troughs. And um, we know, for example, at night that your blood pressure should drop. This is called dipping. And in fact, we also know now that even if you're normotensive, if your blood pressure doesn't drop, if you don't have dipping at night, um, when you're sleeping um, or when you're inactive, that you that this is a this is actually a, um, an individual um, factor and predictor for cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of weight now just um, on the research side from from looking at not just being normotensive versus hypertensive, but actually controlling um, dipping and non-dipping. And so um, how this sort of you know the in in a very general term how this sort of we think interacts with um, obstructive sleep apnea is that not so coincidentally, um, hypoxia inducible factors, which are the transcription factors that are stabilized under hypoxic events, are actually in the same pass family as um, the core canonical clock proteins. So we know that there is an interaction. And in fact, um, th this, this sort of understanding has been demonstrated even um, as early as the 1990s. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Hoganesh, who's uh, again is my mentor, had done some early work on identification of BMOL, which is one of the core positive regulators of the clock, and um, its ability to um, heterodimerize with some hypoxia-inducible factors. So we've known this for a long time that these factors can heterodimerize and actually change um, transcriptional regulation um, of certain sort of outputs. So we know, you know, from sort of the um, from the clock itself, we know that many factors change or disrupt the clock, right? So our internal factors like age, uh, mental illness, neurocognitive changes, hormonal changes can impact. And I think sort of the easiest way to understand this is how our sleep architecture changes throughout our lives. We know that at certain times we're more likely to be um, phase delayed, for example, and at certain times we're more likely to have um, what is considered low amplitude of the clock or light sleep. But there are lots of external factors that can affect it too, right? So light, exercise, food intake, these are the things um, that sort of dictate um, societal influence on our clock and can cause things like jet lag <coughs> or social jet lag, which is, is now pretty, um, pretty well established and, and um, sort of a big problem um, for the patients that I see in, in my clinic. And so um, sort of right at the time that I was sort of approaching this topic and establishing this work in the lab, um, one of the um, groups that I collaborate with, um, Gad Asher, who uh, is in Israel, had published this work um, showing the modulation of oxygen levels and how it actually accelerates recovery of mice in a jet lag protocol, meaning if you use lower levels of oxygen exposure for these mice, you could actually get them to recover from a jet lag uh, model faster. And so, again, this was sort of this link between um, hypoxia and its effects on the clock. And more recently, um, we actually um, published a paper in PNAS where we looked at um, the sort of exposure um, at random times, uh, certain times throughout a 24 hour period and how these hypoxic episodes can actually cause phase shifting of the clock, but it's tissue dependent. So um, the, the way that our clocks respond to hypoxic events in the lung versus the kidney versus the liver are actually different. And so again, that was um, sort of a, another representation of how um, the clocks throughout the body actually respond differently to some of these exciting events. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what I do in the basic science lab, and then I'm going to sort of branch into what we're doing more globally at the hospital. Um, but I, um, I became very interested in how um, hypoxia and the circadian clock could be sort of intertwined and how circadian dysregulation might be a component for the clinical sequela that we see with obstructive sleep apnea. So I bought some of this equipment um, on the left is a light box, which we use to sort of um, expose mice to light and dark at very specific times. It has to be stringently controlled. And of course, um, mice um, experience their inactive phase during light, and that's an evolutionary trend to avoid predators. And so they have sort of the opposite, what we call sleep time, although they're not, they don't really have a true sleep time. They have more of an inactive phase time. And this is actually the hypoxic chamber um, that um, where we put the, the mice. So that's looks probably happier than it actually is when it sits in the chamber. But nonetheless, this is sort of the model that we use. And the instrument to the right is called a, um, a luma cycle. And so for some of these mice, and I'll actually get to one of these slides in a second, they actually have, we, we can actually study sort of the, the clock function by looking at um, the bioluminescent markers that are tagged with some of these core clock proteins. And so the general you know, protocol for what I do, um, and there's, there's a lot of variability in this and looking at short-term versus long-term or chronic exposure. 
Um, but I, I basically take mice and expose them to um, different um, lengths of intermittent hypoxic episodes. And so these machines you can program and they basically cycle between low and, and, and sort of FI and normal um, room air oxygen levels. Um, and then we um, harvest different tissues, heart, kidney, liver, lung, um, because we're interested in sort of the impact of these hypoxic events on um, specifically the clock proteins in these different tissues. And so this is um, this was actually the very first uh, figure that I put together when I was setting up my lab work as a fellow in um, pediatric otolaryngology. So I was really investing a lot of time on nights and weekends because this was a surgically heavy clinical fellowship. But um, I knew that I wanted to sort of try to establish this this um, benchtop research. And so um, basically, we took mice that we exposed to intermittent hypoxia for two weeks, and um, at the end of the two weeks. We um, sacrificed the mice and took lung slices and we put them in a luma cycle. And so what you're seeing is in red, this is actually just the bioluminescence of the lung tissue in, um, in o over days. And so we typically cut out the first couple of days because there's a lot of static and noise when you transplant this tissue into a cell culture. But over, over time, what you can start to see is this fluctuation. And this is a representation of PER2, which is a sort of a general rep representation of the clock. But the red lines are actually the lung slices from the mice that were exposed to intermittent hypoxia, and the black lines are the lung slices from the control mice. So we, what we noticed, obviously, was that there were changes in um, the baseline or the sort of like low level, and then the amplitude, so how high this actually stretches to its peak. And so um, we knew that this was, you know, the intermittent hypoxic episodes were causing these sort of broad changes in the clock, but then this, you know, led us down this bigger path. So more recently, and this is actually a paper that I have in submission now, I'm actually working on the revisions to resubmit it next week, but we started to do um, single cell sequencing and bulk RNA sequencing. And just um, sort of, you know, to describe, you know, what our interest is, we really wanted to do some, I wanted to do some short-term exposures to see um, how these um, sort of sequencing effects change. So what gene expression pathways are up and down regulated in specific tissues and, and this um, data set that I have is from the lung, but how, how does this change from a short-term exposure to intermittent hypoxia before you actually see clinical sequela? And so um, this was um, some of the bulk RNA sequencing. So after you um, sacrifice the mice and harvest the organs, you um, actually sort of analyze um, and get RNA from all of the tissue. So every, every bit of the cells. And so this is a representation, sort of a, an average of the, um, of the sequencing data that changes in all of the cell populations within the lung. And what you can see across the board, just to point out a few, is that we have sort of big changes in angiogenesis and the response to hypoxia and the circadian rhythm. And when we look at specific markers between um, in the circadian clock, so these are targets or, you know, some of these are core canonical clock proteins like PER3 and DBP. And then we do the same thing for hypoxia and the immune response. And what we saw um, typically was that some of these circadian targets are actually upregulated in response to intermittent hypoxia, hypoxia, while a lot of the immune response pathways are actually downregulated, which is a bit counterintuitive. Um, and so um, the next thing that we wanted to do was actually single cell sequencing. And if, um, if any of you do single cell sequencing, it's, it's quite laborious, but you basically take the tissue and you um, dissociate it into single cell suspensions. And then you actually put it through um, a pretty complex device that sort of tags, it makes a library of the RNA. So um, with these, um, with the sort of search for specific markers, you can identify specific cell populations. So once you've identified these specific cell populations, you can actually get that same sequencing data, but you can get it from the individual cells. So now you know how, not just the sort of population of cells respond, but how each individual cell responds. And so this is actually just a UMAP, so the, the different cell populations that we identified from the lung um, along our se single cell sequencing. <clears throat> and, um, you know, again, what was important for me was that we were identifying these um, these um, expression pathway changes um, before we actually see significant histopathologic changes. And so um, for some of the early single cell sequencing work, again, um, expected to see changes in circadian rhythm, but we were, of course, excited to see that these were pretty well elevated and not just in some of the cells that previous research has shown these changes to be present in, but in some cells that were quite surprising, like um, endothelial cells, for example, actually have a very large sort of upregulation in the circadian rhythm pathways. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> and um, of course, myofibroblasts, which are cells to, um, are, that are known to respond to um, intermittent hypoxic diseases like pulmonary hypertension and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, but we see <clears throat> quite a large response from our intermittent hypoxia pathway um, within these myofibroblasts and fibroblasts as well. And so, um, again, like we were specifically interested in circadian rhythm and immune responses. And so um, we then looked at these individual cell populations like endothelial cells and myofibroblasts. And what we saw from the bulk RNA sequencing was actually very similar to what we identified in single cell sequencing. But now we can see how dramatic these changes are in specific cell populations and less so in other cells like alveolar type 1 cells and some of the ciliated cells. And um, and even sort of within specific cell types, so endothelial cells were a prime example, and we actually found um, through single cell sequencing that there are different um, endothelial cell populations, and this is this was actually um, um, sort of a hot topic right now. There's a group at Stanford who's doing single cell sequencing and looking at these specific endothelial cell populations. Um, but we actually found that the responses, meaning the changes in these pathways on, along the circadian rhythm, were actually quite variable between the different types of endothelial cells. So um, endothelial capillary cells, for example, have a, a large change, a large upregulation in the circadian rhythm pathways, while arterial endothelial cells actually had um, a nominal change. And then um, sort of at the, at least for this manuscript, one of the things that we were very interested in was um, for patients that have, so humans that have lung diseases, um, how similar are the changes in these transcriptional pathways between those humans with lung disease and the mice that we um, had exposed to intermittent hypoxia? So um, much smarter people than me in the lab actually used the sequencing data from our mice and compared them to the sequencing data um, that we have from public databases for patients that had different pulmonary diseases and had had um, long samples taken from them. So um, diseases like pulmonary hypertension, um, COPD, asthma, allergic asthma. So, and what I would point out is, again, um, we became very interested in certain cell populations like myofibroblasts and fibroblasts because what we found was that um, sort of the, the size of the circle dictates sort of the overlap in the common pathways. But the changes that we see from intermittent hypoxia have a lot of overlap with a lot of these other sort of pulmonary diseases in humans. And this is not surprising because a lot of these disease processes um, also sort of involve episodes of hypoxia or intermittent hypoxia. But, and this is sort of the, the last figure, at least from this manuscript, this is, a, um, this is pretty complex. But basically what we did was we looked at sort of um, all the um, drug targets that are commonly used now for different pulmonary diseases, like pulmonary hypertension, COPD, asthma, <clears throat> and we um, identified what the, what the specific target is. So what protein are these um, drugs actually targeting in the disease process? And then we looked at these, um, what is the equivalent of these drug targets in the mouse homolog to see whether or not these um, drug targets actually were modified um, in intermittent hypoxia. And so what that allowed us to do was identify specific targets for some drugs that are already used in humans. And I mentioned this not to say that you know, we, we think that you can, we're already at the stage where you can use drug targets and obstructive sleep apnea. But the point is, obstructive sleep apnea is very complex and it, evolve, it involves um, different processes and different organs. And we don't even really have a good understanding of how these gene expression pathways change between early and late disease. And so this process now for our lab is, how do we go through these different tissues like heart and kidney and lung things that we know that respond to intermittent hypoxia and identify potential targets for, um, for medical therapies later. So we, you know, for conclusions from some of our early work, we know that exposure to intermittent hypoxia changes the clock function in mouse lung. Um, we know that intermittent hypoxia induces changes that resemble other sort of unrelated pulmonary diseases. And we can see very specific um, cell type changes in gene expression. And this is um, where a lot of our lab is focused now. So once we've done single cell sequencing and we can identify cell populations, can you then go back and use things like cell sorting to <clears throat> isolate some of these cells and do um, more specific work? <clears throat> but on um, sort of a bigger scale, you know, we, we want to identify cells that sort of drive this early disease process. Like, can we intervene before they go on after decades of untreated disease to develop these clinical sequelae? Can we identify molecular targets for intervention? Um, and can we develop new diagnostic tests? And that's 
um, a, a, another area of interest for me right now. And so this this um, sort of, sort of Zoo's paper that was published in JCI Insight was an example of some of these <coughs> sort of like organoid models where you can actually identify um, specific cell populations. And and in, and in this study, um, looking at things like um, cells that specifically contributed to other pulmonary diseases like cystic fibrosis and alterations of that specific cell type, you can actually sort of modify the disease um, outcome. We also have other measures to study sleep because as you can imagine, sleep fragmentation is an important component. And so we have um, a system called the piezo system where it's actually a pad. And so rather than doing implanted EEGs, you can actually just put these mice on these um, electrophysiologic pads, like what we've done in research and sleep medicine, and you can look at sleep wake cycles. And so it's a non-invasive way to look at sleep fragmentation. And so we've, we've already got some early data for um, some of these types of experiments. And then I think um, really um, in the in the circadian world, very little has been paid attention to sort of the sex related responses, meaning what happens between males and females, because we know that the responses are different. And in fact, even within specific populations, so um, obstructive sleep apnea, for example, the, the way that sleep apnea presents, the type of hypoxic exposures, sort of the proportion of um, hypopnic events versus apneic events can be different in males and females at different stages. And so, um, for example, when females go through menopause, they can experience um, OSA that sort of looks more like what males um, in, in midlife have. And so we've already seen um, some examples of where um, exposure at specific times um, in the inactive phase can actually produce different responses between male and female mouse. And so um, we have uh, obviously a, a lot of work that we need to do sort of in the future on the lab front. And I think this is a good time to transition. I wanted to spend the second half talking about um, sort of how we've applied this in the hospital. And so when I started to do this work with um, John, we really, um, he was previously at Penn and he had made this sort of effort over the last 10 years to take these concepts in circadian biology and apply them to patient care. Um, because, you know, as I've mentioned before, there are disease processes that we know are sort of directly related to circadian dysregulation. And I just, as, as we sort of built this um, program, what we were really interested in doing was, you know, taking some of these concepts in the lab and applying it directly to patient care. And so we started um, literally knocking on doors, going to different divisions um, for, you know, people, clinicians that are doing sort of clinical research that we think um, could be um, sort of tapped into from a circadian perspective. And so um, the implications for this, you know, for clinical practice are new diagnostic techniques. Uh, modifications to current therapies, really just talking about timing and sort of development of new medical therapies. And so I want to give some um, just examples of some of the projects that we had set up um, from a clinical research perspective. And so how you can take these concepts in circadian biology and apply it to um, really across the hospital. And so one of the one of the earliest things that we did, um, um, Dr. Hoganesh and Mark Rubin, who's a postdoc in, in John's lab, and Garrett Fitzgerald, who's um, a clinician scientist at Penn who's actually done pretty well known in the cardiovascular research world. But we um, really became interested in the type of studies that have been done in the past. So what sort of time trials have actually been done? And if you look back in the literature, you know, these circadian studies really. So if you take medication and you give it at specific times, for example, does that change or modify or improve care for your patients? And the answer is yes, there are lots of studies that have shown that. Um, some of the research that, that has been done in the past has focused on blood pressure, for example. So now we know that um, you can take, um, for example, short acting blood pressure medications and use it at night. And in many cases, the response that you get is better because not only do you convert hypertensive patients to normotensive patients, but you can actually improve those patients that have non-dipping, meaning their blood pressure doesn't drop at night and you can convert it to dipping. Um, and then um, other work that sort of has involved time studies, um, chemotherapeutics, for example. So we know that um, there, there's actually some research now looking at the time of therapy for chemotherapeutics. You can actually um, improve the outcomes. And a lot of this is related to the fact that giving chemotherapeutics for certain cancers can modify the side effects that patients have. And so you can actually improve their tolerance and how long they actually can stay um, on these certain protocols. And so there are some, um, there are actually some groups in Europe that are doing um, clinical trials, studying, um, giving these therapeutics at specific times of the day and looking at outcomes. 
But the, there are lots of studies in the past starting um, back even into the 1960s. And this is at the same time that Seymour Benzer was actually doing some of his early work on, on Drosophila. Um, but there are studies that go back looking at just giving medication at different times of the day and how it can impact the outcome. And so what we found, um, we actually um, um, had this manuscript where we were looking at um, the drug half-life. And what we found is that the response meaning some of these studies looking at these time of day administrations of medications, um, they actually do better when they use shorter half-life drugs. But even drugs that have half-lives in the realm of eight to 15 hours, you can still see a time of day response. And so um, after we published this paper, we became very interested in um, some of the um, um, drug targets that we know are cyclical or rhythmic, meaning they're, um, they're directly controlled by the circadian clock. And, and um, one of these was <clears throat> sort of the, um, the targets for hydralazine, because hydralazine is a medication that's administered very frequently in the ICUs um, for patients that have um, blood pressure issues. And so um, we have a huge amount of data here. And so we started getting um, a lot of this EMR data for um, not just thousands, but um, if you see hundreds of thousands and millions of data points. And so this was um, an, another paper that we had published um, recently where we were interested sort of in, in how hydralazine was given during the day and whether or not the primary times that this drug is given correlate to the times where um, the, like the peak point at which you give it can actually produce a physiologic effect. Meaning, um, when we give these, tar these drugs in the hospital, are we giving them because this is what's dictated by the way that we round? and the way that the hospital sort of, um, the way that we have shift work established, or is it um, that we're giving these drugs at the times that are the most physiologically appropriate for the patients? And so bear with me, I know this is a complex slide, but when we, um, when we started looking at hydralazine specifically, what we noticed is that there were these time points during the day where a lot of these doses are given. And not so coincidentally, so if you look at this wheel, this is actually um, the size of these triangles tells you how many doses are given along this clock, so at the time of day. And not so surprisingly, what we found is that not just hydralazine, but we actually went back and looked at a host of drugs, about 20 drugs. We found that there was a huge spike in the a number of drugs that were given at you know, nine o'clock in the morning. And so in the red, what you can see is the time that we have shift changes and rounding. And so not so coincidentally, you know, a team comes into the hospital, they see that there were issues overnight, probably in the realm of one to four or 5 a.m. And then they, um, because the team is there, they start dosing people with medications to control things like blood pressure problems. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, there aren't doses that are given at acute times, and we can certainly see this, but for the most part, most of these drugs are given at very specific times, peaking in, um, at rounding time in the morning and also in the afternoon. And so um, it's not just, it's not just hydralazine. We actually looked at analgesics, for example, like morphine and acetaminophen. And again, we can see these rhythmic distributions of drugs throughout the day. But analgesics um, are another sort of example where um, there's a lot of data to show that um, the, the amount of pain that you experience is rhythmically controlled. So we know that patients, some patients with certain disease processes experience more pain at night than they do during the day. But it's not uncommon that you'll come in on rounds and you'll talk to a patient and they'll say, I had a lot of pain last night, but I really didn't see the nurse that frequently and I, I didn't get the, you know, the drugs that I needed. And so um, I think this sort of aligns with some of the things that we see clinically. But we also saw this for other drugs like anti-infectives um, and things like antihistamines. And so um, actually when we had submitted this manuscript to PNAS, one of the things that the reviewers wanted to know was, did this have a direct effect on the response, for example? So we went back and we actually looked at the physiologic response to hydralazine, meaning, so at what point in the time of day when you give a dose do you have the largest physiologic response? And what we found basically was that the time of day that we give these medications predominantly does not necessarily align with the time that they have the strongest physiologic response from the drug. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be giving the drugs when we're giving it. It just means that we don't necessarily consider time when we provide therapy for patients in the hospital. So um, some of the, this is actually some newer work that we're, we're putting a manuscript together for this now. But one of the things that we became interested in was um, analytes, for example. So we take uh, blood work um, all the time for many different things. We take it from urine, from blood, from CSF, and we use these basically to um, sort of determine how stable a patient is. But what's interesting, um, sort of some of the things that we've discovered along this path was that 
um, our, our sort of normative range, what we look at for kids, like if you get a CBC, for example, and you see that the, um, you know, white blood cell count or red blood cell count is outside of the range, um, for children, unlike for adults, we don't actually use normal healthy children when we um, draw this normative data. So the, the range that we establish for patients in the hospital actually come from patients that might have a problem, might have a disease process, and they're getting labs to evaluate for that. So we aren't necessarily seeing normative ranges that, um, that are from, from healthy patients. And this is important, I'll tell you why. So as we started to look at, um, we started collecting data points from patients in the hospital at every time point. So not just between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., but actually overnight as well. And what we started to see um, using um, some of our algorithms was that many of these lab values that we see actually have rhythmicity. So there are points in the day when they have peaks and points of the day when they have troughs. And just as a sort of a comparison, there's very little data out there that's been done in humans, um, healthy humans, but we did actually look specifically at some of these lab values and compare them to what's been published. And so on the top, this is actually the lab values that we obtained for um, actually hundreds of thousands of patient interactions. And so um, at the bottom is actually previously published data. And so I just wanted to demonstrate that there is um, a, a lot of overlap, like very similarity, very, very, very similar sort of values between what we see for um, children that are getting lab draws, meaning at 6 a.m. you see, you know, a, a large sort of increase in the red blood cell count. And this actually coincides with what's been previously published in, in middle-aged men. But but the point of this is that these lab values were only taken between specific time points. And so the time points that they collected were generally between 6 or 8 a.m. and maybe 5 p.m. But, but we really don't have normative data for lab values between 8 p.m. and you know, midnight or midnight and 5 a.m. And so what we started to see was that um, there are um, time points where the lab values actually drop below or go above the normative range but because it's in the middle of the night, um, it's, it's very hard to say that it's um, a disease process and it actually could be um, circadian rhythmic control of these lab values. So we know that lab values have rhythmicity like TSH, for example. If you draw it at 6 a.m., it can be very different than if you draw it at you know, 8 p.m. And that's why we um, draw these at specific times when we round. But so um, the other thing that we noticed was that um, over time, so if you draw lab values very early in age, meaning less than three months or three months to one year, you don't necessarily see um, circadian rhythmicity. But if you start to look at lab values as patients get older, you actually do see that these this rhythmicity actually becomes very well established. So what we're seeing is that um, certain things become um, rhythmic over time in, in patients. And anybody that has kids knows that you don't really develop a very um, consolidated sleep phase when you're first born. It takes eight weeks, 12 weeks, sometimes six months to establish a sleep phase. And much like um, sleep, which is a phenotype of the clock, even lab values have to um, become rhythmic over time. So this is yet another sort of example of how um, things can be controlled by the clock. Um, we're also very interested in improving um, circadian diagnostics. Uh, and I mention this because in the sleep world, um, everybody knows what DILMO is, but um, in order to determine what someone's endogenous clock is doing, we often do a test called dim light melatonin onset. And melatonin, obviously, which is an output um, of the brain, sort of um, prepares you for sleep at night. So you see these peaks of melatonin um, sort of rising as you approach sleep and then peaking two to three hours after you fall asleep. Um, but dim light melatonin onset is very complex. It's very hard to um, it's very hard to do. It's laborious and it's expensive, and lots of things can affect the the results of the test that you're doing. So you basically have to have somebody sit in a dim room for 24 hours, and you collect spit samples every 30 minutes. And so um, one of the things that we became interested in was are there other ways to look at um, someone's endogenous clock. And so this was um, um, another postdoc in John's lab, Gong Wu, who is um, a computational um, biologist. And um, he's published now two papers on um, actually looking at circadian rhythm in the skin. And so um, uh, the short answer is we're able to take 
um, very small pieces of the skin um, at one time point. So you just take a shave of the skin and you look at the um, different clot proteins in the epithelium, and you can actually look at um, um, sort of determine the endogenous clock based off of the proportion of these different clot proteins in relationship to one another. So you don't need to do dim light melatonin onset. And so the hope is that down the line, we can actually use other means that are much easier to sort of use um, to, to study time points. And I think, um, how can this be used? So if we know that someone's endogenous clock is different, it dictates when we give therapies for patients that have sleep disorders like circadian phase delays. But on a much bigger scale, if someone's endogenous clock is different than my endogenous clock, it means that the time that they take medication might be different if you're trying to target a specific, um, a, a specific protein that is rhythmic throughout the day. Meaning if you find that the levels of the drug target peak at specific times, you would modify when you give a medication, but you would individualize it to that patient. And then even feeding time and health, for example. So there are studies to show that um, healthy adolescents that, um, that feed at night versus the day in very short periods, two weeks to four weeks, can become pre-diabetic. Right. So um, when we eat actually dictates our health a lot. And there's a big push now in the literature and it's certainly been mentioned in the news, um, restricted feeding time, for example. So if you if you limit your food intake between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. and don't have food late at night, it's actually easier to lose weight. It's actually easier to control diabetes. And so this time that you feed when you metabolize food is actually very important from a clock perspective. And so um, we set up a study with uh, the bone marrow transplant unit here, um, Stella Davies and Chris Dandoy, who have been um, really phenomenal sort of uh, collaborators. But they were very interested in this because they've been looking at sleep fragmentation in their patients that are getting bone marrow transplants. But one of the things that John and I noticed when we rounded with them on the BMT unit was that these patients predominantly get fed at night, right? So, and the, the historical thinking behind that is that you can disconnect these patients from lines and then they're more mobile during the day. The the reality is a lot of these patients have, they're getting multiple IVs and they have connections, they get IV fluids during the day. So they're not really disconnected. And in fact, a lot of them are very phase delayed because they're adolescents. They come in the hospital, they play video games until two or three o'clock in the morning. And we try very hard not to disturb them because they're going through a lot of stress. But what we found is that that means that they're getting fed at night. And many of these patients have very significant hypertension and are on um, polytherapy, three, four, five different blood pressure medications. So one of the, um, one of um, Chris Dandoy, who's, who's one of the attendings in bone marrow transplant, was interested in sort of working with us on um, developing a, a study where we changed the feeding time. So it's, it's ongoing now. They've recruited six or eight patients and we're doing a randomized crossover trial. So we give um, the pay, half of the patients are fed during the day and half are fed at night and then they actually get switched. And so we're looking at not just um, things like blood pressure control, but um, their immune response. So how quickly they recover after bone marrow transplant, because we think this feeding time can dictate a lot of the immune response um, as well. So this will be, I think, a really interesting study when we're done in, in probably about a year. And then, of, of course, the, the main sort of point and what I want to finish with is um, our end goal was sort of developing the Center for Circadian Medicine. But part of that is like, what is the, how can we apply these concepts in our lab to clinical research as I've demonstrated, but also um, what is the other sort of research that we can do? So we have a registry now where we're looking at um, different um, genetic syndromes that can contribute to um, circadian and sleep disorders like phase delays and phase advances. And along those lines, you know, we, there are many different ways to treat circadian disorders in patients. It's sort of off-label in adults, but it's the wild, wild west in children. So everything that we give, you know, medication-wise is, is off-label. And so, um, and, and there aren't established protocols. And so a lot of this, you know, for my work is how do we phase advance someone who's significantly phase delayed? How do we use light therapy? What's the best sort of light response, what's the best time to administer it? What medications work best for patients as sleep consolidators, for example? So we use a lot of, you know, um, sort of more complex medications like Belsomra. We use TCAs, SSRIs in very young kids. You know, we start using gabapentin for restless sleep in two-year-olds, for example. And how can we use, how can we actually improve the way that we um, administer treatment for these patients? So um, one of the things that we're doing in our, um, in our lab and in our clinic, this was an example, but 
we became interested in developing a sleep gene panel. So one of my counterparts in the clinic is a child neurologist who sleep boarded, and he specializes in um, sort of um, patients that have epilepsy because they often have sleep disruption. But in, you know, in epilepsy, just like in hearing loss, we have panels where we can actually screen patients for um, um, mutations in certain targets that we think uh, that lend to um, epilepsy and lend to hearing loss, right? And so we're doing the same thing with sleep. So we're actually working with the team through human genetics now, where we're actually, um, we've done um, sort of machine learning to identify, to look at other sort of public databases, to look at um, GWAS studies, to find targets for sleep disruption. And so we're looking at not just in, um, in sleep disruption like phase delay, but all types of sleep disruption like restless leg syndrome and narcolepsy, for example, and compiling it into a sleep gene panel. And then hopefully we'll start using this clinically. So a patient comes to our clinic, they have a problem, and we can actually screen them with the sleep gene panel to look for um, different targets. So, and the end result, and I, I, I put this up here because this, this um, website just got uh, uh, just started up and running. But this was actually the website for the circadian medicine clinic. So now um, I don't actually do a general sleep disorders clinic. Every um, sleep clinic that I have is specifically a circadian disorders clinic. And so um, Tom Dye, who's the child neurologist, and I partner with one of our um, sleep psychologists, um, Daniel um, Graff or Kelly Byers. And so we actually approach these patients collaboratively. So we use things like cognitive behavioral therapy and medical therapy medications, for example, and sleep consolidators to try to, um, to, try to treat these patients. And it's complex because they come in with different types of insomnia. We have a large percentage of patients that have genetic syndromes, and we know that sleep disruption is very common in this population. But um, this is sort of the culmination of, you know, three years of work, sort of establishing this clinic. Um, we actually got internal funding um, through our ARC, um, ARC funding, which is the um, Academic and Review Committee, but it was um, one and a half million dollars to sort of establish the Circadian Center. And it helped me get a CRC who um, is research focused. She comes to all of these clinics so that we recruit um, sleep questionnaires. We get actigraphy on all of these patients and we can actually do um, genetic screening um, for families if we see that there are multiple affected family members. And so this is really sort of the end result of, of a lot of work in the lab and, of course, um, in clinical research. And I think I'll, I'll finish by saying that this is a collaborative approach. I mean, I have, you know, these are people that we interact with commonly, but we have um, collaborators in immunobiology and plastic surgery, neurology, pulmonary medicine, human genetics, and of course, ENT and the Sleep Center. But this was, you know, work of, um, you know, dozens of people. And so I just want to, um, as a last slide, I want to thank, obviously, John Hoganesh, because he was really the person that took me under his wing and, and made all this happen. But I've had a lot of other collaborators on the basic science and the, um, tra and the translational research side. And I would point out Rofe, I mean, because um, as head of pulmonary, I started working with him as a fellow in ENT. But he really sort of took, took me down this path for clinical research and even um, getting back into the lab. And he really sort of helped me establish myself at, at the institution. Just want to say thank you very much, and I will stop sharing and then take questions. So, David, a phenomenal talk. You've inspired a whole bunch of uh, text, question, and chatter, and ideas. By the way, in the background here, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we do have time for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, there's one while others are waiting to sort of tee up and maybe raise their hand in the chat room. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Lorenz. Uh, you mentioned social jet lag. Can you explain what that is? So, so social jet lag. So just like um, you know, the the at least from a sleep sort of ICSD sort of component, jet lag is you know you get on a plane, you end up in a, a time zone six hours different, and you suffer the consequences, and you suffer those consequences for days and sometimes weeks, and a lot of it depends on um, where you're at and how many time zones you go. Um, what we see, now, one of the consequences now, especially for younger people, is social jet lag. Social jet lag is a similar problem, but it's influenced by like how, basically how we live our lives with technology, right? So you, um, so you um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, you go out, you stay up until two or three o'clock in the morning, um, and then you go home and you try to fall asleep. But um, on, during the week, you have to get up for work. Um, and then this is heavily influenced by technology as well, right? So I live and die by my phone. I tell all of my patients that you need to turn off anything that emits blue light at least two hours before bed. The reality is at midnight, I'm still looking at my phone and checking emails and sending text messages while I'm trying to go to sleep. 
And so um, that's really, you know, like a broad sort of summary of what social jet lag is. But it's basically a jet lag type disease, but it's influenced by the way that we live our lives, especially now with technology. And it's and it's very problematic, especially for teens and adolescents and young adults, um, because they're much more attuned to current technology. I mean, I will tell you that my 11 year old can get into a program on my phone much faster than I can. So no doubt about it. And uh, next question is from Paul Bryson. Yes, good morning, David. Thank you so much for a, for a wonderful presentation. I commend you on, on everything you've been able to do and do collaboratively. I had a couple questions for you. Number one, um, I was really intrigued by the concept of feeding timing. Um, are you aware of um, the impact of, uh, of some of your work on perhaps cancer cachexia in adults or perhaps the impact of circadian rhythm during radiation or chemo radiation? Yeah, that's actually, that's a phenomenal question. So um, we have a postdoc in our lab who, um, before he came here, was actually um, in a lab at Kentucky that specifically studied feeding time. And one of their interests was actually in cancer. Um, we, that's that's an ongoing discussion. We actually, um, so Jif and uh, Pelos, who's in John's lab, and I had actually just presented to the GI department here, because um, as you can imagine, the GI division, um, are, these are people who, have issues with um, patients like, you know, large populations of patients that get tube feeds, for example. But it's very difficult because many of these patients you can only feed at specific times because they're getting so much, right? And, and some of that is dictated by like how you're trying to modulate their um, nutritional intake. And so um, it's in some of these patients, it's very difficult. But we know that responses to radiation, for example, that just because you mentioned it as a prime example, chemo, um, chemotherapy and radiation, the time that you administer those therapies can actually um, can modify like like how they respond to it, and some of that is their nausea, some of that is the, um, their like feeding ability, some of their some of that is response, but some of that is probably also the way that they absorb nutrition. And so um, there are other labs um, at different institutions. We collaborate with some people at Vanderbilt and another one at Harvard who specifically study feeding time, and this is sort of like the the like the main focus of what they do. There is research out there. I'm I'm certainly not the content expert from that area, but I can tell you that it's definitely being studied right now. Um, if you're interested, I'm happy to um, um, get a list of the people that are doing this and, and email it to you um, later on today or tomorrow if you're if you're more interested in that in that topic. Um, but yeah, feeding time in the in the circadian biology world for the PhDs that study the clock, feeding time is actually probably I'd say one of the most studied topics right now. The next question is from a guest VS. Forgive me, I'm not sure who that is. Maybe. Hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Matt. So uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Also, I'm Vaishal. Uh, I'm from Pediatrics Leap here. Um, uh, pretty, pretty good. So th two questions. Is your research predominantly, are you studying in children, adult or both? And second, um, uh, one of the things you mentioned about your own work is looking at treatments, right? So the clinical aspect of um, particularly phase delays and so forth. So right. in your opinion, th there are a lot of time practical challenges on exactly determining timing when to do it. Is yes. have you is that what you're studying with um, with your work? Um, one of the recent research I've learned is instead of core body temperature minimum, they are trying to look at whether mid slip time could be a, a potential uh, timing based on which we can do the light therapy. So what are, what is your opinion on and what are you studying in that area? Yeah, great question. And I, you know, just for the sake of time, obviously, because I wanted to try to touch base on a lot of things, I didn't go into a lot of detail, but the circadian clinic, the way that we have it structured now is it's, um, it's almost like a, I wouldn't call it a research clinic because we're providing treatments, but the, the research component is 50% of what we do. And so the ARC funding that we got was actually to establish a research core within that clinic. So for every clinic, every patient that, that we see actually gets a, a very, very long sort of questionnaire um, before they even come to clinic. So yes, we have some things like um, pediatric sleep questionnaires and morningness, eveningness questionnaires, but we also have a lot of behavioral um, questionnaires as well. And so all of the patients automatically get actigraphy. And unlike what the ICSD recommends for um, two to four weeks, like we automatically try to do four weeks. Yeah. And so we try to get four weeks of actigraphy. We get sleep questionnaires. Um, for patients where they have multiple affected family members, we're actually doing, um, we actually collect um, we actually collect buccal swabs. And so we're isolating DNA and RNA and actually looking, we're doing whole exome sequencing to look for gene targets. We've already identified some gene targets that are in fact circadian clock. That's other papers that we're working on. And then the, the goal of this is to actually look at those results right before and after. 
And just as an example, we've even partnered with um, one of the innovation divisions at UC, University of Cincinnati. And so they're working on a band that collects sweat. And so the hope would be eventually that we could use these bands to collect sweat to look at cortisol and melatonin. And the, the main reason for this is that, you know, people have different preferences. Some people believe in dim light melatonin onset. Some people really don't think that it works well. There's a researcher at Harvard who's a circadian biologist that will tell you that urinary melatonin is much more specific than than um, than serum melatonin and he doesn't or or even saliva and he doesn't believe in it. So he specifically collects urinary melatonin when he use, looks at these adolescents with circadian disorders. But it's but the the point is like it's very hard to validate or protocolize what you're doing when everybody's doing it differently. So the goal is that over, you know, two or three or four years, we're collecting data and we sort of compare the results of actigraphy and the questionnaires and what we find from, you know, mid sleep time versus like what we see from dim light melatonin onset. We actually even have, um, so we actually went to Harvard because their adult um, circadian clinic is, was one of the earliest ones. In fact, there are only two circadian, two other adult circadian clinics in the United States. There are none at pediatric hospitals. Um, but they actually do a, an abridged version for dim light melatonin onset that's eight hours. And so the goal is that you do it during the peak session. And so they actually, it's a take home test so they can mail it to patients and you only have to collect it over eight hours. And so you don't have to do a 24 hour test. And so there are lots of these techniques that we're using to figure out like, okay, you know, the reality is for many patients where we treat, we don't get the response that we want. Was it the wrong treatment or was simply that we just didn't do it in the right sort of reactive phase, right? And so there are these active phases for light administration and for melatonin administration and sleep consolidators. And if you're outside of that window, especially for patients that have genetic syndromes and it's much more tight, you're probably not using the wrong therapy. You're just doing it at the wrong time. And so the answer to your question is, I don't think any of us have definitive answers, but that's that's really like the main goal of this clinic is to try to figure that out. Yeah, fascinating, thanks. The next question is from Dr. Mira. Thank you so much, David. That was uh, fantastic. You're such a great ambassador for the field of sleep medicine. Um, I'm uh, from the Sleep Disorder Center here, um, and Rena Mira, and uh, just had a couple questions about your intermittent hypoxia work. I think that's fascinating, and wondering about kind of the interplay of circadian uh, plasticity and intermittent hypoxia, even across aging, and you know, even looking at your kind of future directions and next steps, wondering if that's something that you're interested in. And then secondly, wondering how you took into consideration other aspects of sleep apnea pathophysiology in your experimental models. For example, you know, we know hypoxia triggers sympathetic activation, the autonomic nervous system fluctuations you mentioned, um, and even sleep duration. We know that um, we've done some work showing that, um, you know, acute versus chronic uh, curtailment in sleep leads to differential upregulation and uh, biomarkers of inflammation. So how you kind of took those other factors into consideration. And again, thanks for an incredible talk. Yeah, so, I mean, both really good questions. So um, the circadian plasticity, it's interesting because in the circadian world, I mean, I was not a circadian biologist when I started here. I, my background, I had a PhD in physiology and then wanted to torture my family. So I told him I was gonna go back to med school. And so my, my background was more in cardiovascular disease and the inflammatory processes. So I studied the leukocyte adhesion cascade. But what I found in the circadian world is that in fact, a lot of the circadian researchers started out as people that did research in aging because a lot of these things change over time, right? And we know that like the aging process, there's a big overlap between very, very different disease processes. So obstructive sleep apnea, for example, alters um, sort of aging targets, um, just like um, dementia, for example. So we know that OSA, as you well know, is, is actually associated and correlated to early onset Alzheimer's. And that, that cause and effect relationship is very difficult in humans, but that, that sort of like how things change over time is, is of great interest to circadian biologists. And so um, that's, you know, at least in my studies, like how I have it set up is that I wanna look at, you know, like intermittent exposure, look at younger mice, and then look at older mice and chronic exposures, because those targets are um, like prime for research because we really don't understand it. And so I think along those lines, I'm very interested in how things change between um, the age of mice as a representation, but also like in the length of exposure. Um, I don't know if you, you noticed this, but when I gave the, um, the, when I showed the slide about serum cytokines, the very interesting thing about it was that um, in mild OSA, the fluctuations in cytokines are much greater than in severe OSA. And this is actually, like we've seen this in multiple 
uh, multiple areas. But we think that there's this homeostatic mechanism that's disrupted over time. And that's something that we described in that paper in Sleep that we published in 2017. This is Rofa I means, you know, it's been his prime interest from a cardiovascular standpoint for a long time. But so I, I that's that's a particular interest. And I think, you know, very quickly, because I, I don't want to keep people too long, but um, for the other components, you know, there are lots of models for obstructive sleep apnea. And I can tell you that it took me six months of like debating because as a fellow, like anything that you're going to spend $40,000 on a system and it's going to like completely fail, it was pretty disheartening to me. But, you know, there are, there are different models. There are knockout mice, for example, but there's a lot of controversy about do the orexin knockouts actually more represent central apneas in some events and not necessarily obstructive events. And I think that there are, you know, the tracheal balloons, which were some of the earlier models, which were done in, you know, larger animals like dogs and rabbits. Um, they actually had a like a rat model. So tracheal balloon dilation was one. But my, you know, as an otolaryngologist, I was very concerned that that model more represented um, subglottic and tracheal stenosis, which is quite different. Um, but um, and so the intermittent hypoxia, I think, you know, David Gozal obviously is a well-known pediatric pulmonologist who's done probably more of this research with intermittent hypoxia model for a long time. And so the two people that I um, had sort of contacted, um, Seva Polotsky, who was one of my mentors at Hopkins in sleep medicine, he actually uses this model. And in fact, I just purchased his system. But there, there's a lot of data showing that intermittent hypoxia sort of has a has a direct link to this autonomic dysregulation. It also has a direct link to metabolic dysregulation. And Jonathan June who you know started working with Seva Polatsky, they published multiple papers on metabolic dysregulation in this model. I think that there are lots of things to consider, like temperature, for example, time of administration. And so we, we sort of consider a lot of those things, but the reality is you have to look at them each individually. So like sleep fragmentation, for example, we have a lot of data showing that um, what we see in humans, we actually see from the piezo system. So they are sleepier, but it's predominantly sleepier during their active phase, which is you know a lot of what we see in people. We actually have we're setting up a telemetry system so that we can look at heart rate and blood pressure. And so one of the things that we're going to study in coordination with the, the genetic markers is actually some of the physiologic output. So I, I know, again, I, I didn't have time to talk about that. But yeah, I mean, really important questions. And, and there is it's I think it's really you have to be very careful about sort of um, distinguishing each one of the components and then trying to figure out how they work together. Well, well, you obviously didn't try to cover much in your talk. It was such a slow pace, <laughs> David. Um, uh, I think the we have time maybe for the last uh, question or comment from uh, Dr. Koo. I just want to say thank you so much, Dave, for such a fascinating talk. And I, I have known Dave since residency, and it's really amazing to see how much you've accomplished in such a short period of time, although it was never a doubt when I um, you know, met you in residency. And just a side note, uh, Dave Smith is one of the most black clouds that you'll ever meet. <laughs> so he's probably set the record for the number of carotid blowouts and slash trachs during residency. Um, but my quick question is... So I don't take blame <laughs> if they happened. My quick question is, so in your um, hypoxia model, um, you showed a lot of molecular future possible um, targets for therapy in the end organ um, changes are there are they pretty much similar targets where uh, one or two medications could you know potentially treat or prevent changes in all of those organs or do you have to target different ones based on the organ yeah so that's a great question so that is i think the fundamental question of obstructive sleep apnea why is it for some patients, they can they could have sort of severe obstructive sleep apnea for decades and not suffer consequences. But for others, you know, te teenagers, for example, that show um, not necessarily overt hypertension, but circadian, uh, I mean, uh, um, autonomic dysregulation, uh, changes in BRS, for example, and they develop type 2 diabetes. This is not uncommon. If you go back in the literature and you look at some of the early studies, you know, like, for example, there's a lot of controversy about does obstructive sleep apnea cause pulmonary disease? I'm not a pulmonologist, but I work with pulmonary biology. Jeff Witsit is actually one of the authors on this paper that we're submitting, and I would consider him probably one of the most well-known pulmonary biologists in the world, having cloned, um, you know, the, the cells that produce surfactant, right? And so um, there's been a lot embryologically in the lung, for example, and I think that there is data showing, for example, like the early studies where people had true Pickwickian syndrome and they had, you know, what they what was discovered to be severe obstructive sleep apnea and they got a trach and suddenly they were better. And so I would argue that there is pulmonary disease and obstructive sleep apnea, but we can't tell what comes first and what leads to um, sort of the next thing. But the reality is some patients have suffered kidney disease from obstructive sleep apnea or exacerbate um, underlying kidney disease. Some people have very significant cardiovascular disease. Some people develop dementia. And, and 
the question is, why do some patients develop certain cl clinical sequelae and others don't? Um, and so the, the reality is, I think that, you know, this is more like an exploratory process in the beginning, which people don't like when you publish papers, like they want to know that you have a, 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 sorry, a hypothesis. But the reality is we don't really understand why certain organs are affected differently in different patients. And so I think in the very beginning, this is what we have to do. We have to sort of develop a library of the targets, what's affected, what's affected in different organs and why they work together. Or, you know, the reality is in some, in some disease processes, hypoxia is actually advantageous, right? So if you have low levels of hypoxia and you live at, you know, high altitudes, like you can have in some some situations better cardiovascular health in some situations you can have worse cardiovascular health so the the link between intermittent hypoxia and circadian clock is we know that it's different for different targets and different organs respond differently and so i think um for me it, right now it's just what what can we learn so that we have a better understanding of of the clock dysregulation in these different organs so i don't you know like medicinal therapy and obstructive sleep apnea would be the holy grail you know, Phyllis Z, who's um, a circadian researcher and very well-known um, sleep physician who's a neurologist and heads the circadian center at Northwestern, in fact, the first circadian center in the country, um, she published a paper on, you know, cannabinoids, for example, and, and obstructive sleep apnea. But why that works for some people and not others, we don't really understand, right? And so in that group, it was specifically middle-aged male patients with obstructive sleep apnea that had the strongest effect. And so I think there's something to it, but I think that the central component of uh, um, the central control of obstructive sleep apnea and that feedback loop is very complex. That's a long answer, but it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really good question. And I think that, you know, obstructive sleep apnea researchers across the country are sort of looking at that right now. All right. Well, hey, David, thank you. Incredible talk. Uh, and I also want to thank all of our friends and colleagues from the Sleep Center. Uh, you know, we're really excited about all the great collaborations between H&I and the Sleep Center. And and also um, eager to explore uh, future greater collaborations where we can really make an impact together. And we appreciate you guys uh, allowing us to uh, join in on your grand rounds today. So uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you uh, for having me. And I think, um, Dr. Byrne, I think I'm meeting Dr. Fulberry now. So I'm gonna, I think I have a different link maybe. So I'll log out here and then I'll look it at that. It probably is, yeah. All right.